I'm Jillian Cameron, and this is my second in what is hopefully an ongoing series of storytelling. And tonight it is stories of light and dark, and just to get that little mysterious out of the way, uh, here we are. That's Panger Bond, the misnamed orange cat, and he'll be in and out. I'm going to toss him right now, and he can go off and get in trouble. So, the title tonight is Stories, Light and Dark. And what I wanted to do is have some, I, I, my friend Rob Soyder, AKA True Thomas, who hopefully you've been watching some of his storytelling, when we have worked together, he has called me the Princess of Darkness. And I do have this tendency to kind of lean towards um, dark stories. And so I've got two dark stories tonight, both of them from the Brothers Grimm. And then I have, believe it or not, a fairly positive, a very positive Viking story in which nobody gets an ax in their head. Um, I should begin, though. Um, we left somebody in trouble last week, and that was Albert Ramsbot, and we left him in a lion's stomach. So there's more than just the one, and so this is Albert's return. You've had our young Albert Ramsbottom at the zoo at Blackpool one year. We stick with an horse's head handle, give a lion a pork in the air. The name of the lion were Wallace, and the pork in the air made him wild. And before you could say, Bob's your uncle, he'd up and he'd swallowed the child. He was sorry the moment he'd done it. With children, he'd always been chums. And besides, he'd no teeth in his muzzle and he couldn't chew Albert on gums. He could feel the lad moving inside him as he lay on his bed of dried ferns and it might have been little lad's birthday. He wished him such happy returns. But Albert kept kicking and fighting till Wallace arose feeling bad and he felt it were time that he started to arrange a comeback for the lad. So with his head down, he went into the corner on his front paws, he started to work and he coughed and he gagged and he sneezed and he gargled and out Albert shot like a cock. Old Wallace felt better directly and his figure once more became lean. But the only difference in Albert were his face and his hands were quite clean. Meanwhile, Mr. and Mrs. Ramsbottom had gone home to their tea, feeling blue. Ma says, I feel down in the mouth like. Father says, I, I bet Albert does too. Mother says, just goes to show you that the future is never revealed. If I'd thought we was going to lose him, I'd a not had his boots sold and healed. Let's look on the bright side, says father. What can't be up must be endured. Every cloud has a silvery lining. And we did have young Albert insured. Now a knock at the door come that moment, as father these kind words did speak. Twas the man from Prudential, he'd come for his tuppence per person per week. When father saw who it was knocking, he laughed and he kept laughing so, till young man said, what's there to laugh at? Pa says, you're laughing all when you know. Oh, excuse him for laughing, says mother, but things they do happen so strange. Our Albert's been hit by a lion. You've got to pay us for a change. The young man from Prudential said, come, come, let's understand this. You don't mean to say that you've lost him. Ma says, oh, no, we know where he is. When they told him what happened to Albert, a bag from his pocket he drew and he paid out with interest and bonus the sum of nine pounds, four and two. Pa just got his hands at the money. When I face at the window, they see, and mother says, hey, look, it's Albert, and father says, ah, it would be. And Albert come in all excited and started his story to give, and pa says, I never trust lions again, not as long as I live. The young man from the Prudential to pick up the money began, pa says, it Wait a moment, don't be in hurry, young man. And turn into Albert, here's tuppence. Now pop off back to the zoo. Here's your stick with the horses at handle. Go see what the tigers can do. And that's the return of Albert from the recitations of Stanley Holloway. 
Well, this is a story that has a, a particularly horrible stepmother. And it is a pretty awful story, and it's wonderfully awful. Um, and it's called The Juniper Tree. There was a woman who was so much in love with her husband and so overjoyed that she was with child. And interestingly enough, she found herself drawn to the juniper tree behind the house. Every day she would go and water it, and every day she would trim its branches and make sure that it was the healthiest tree. And one day, the pruning shears happened to nip her finger, and this was in the snow, and she looked down, and there were three drops of blood in the snow. And she said, oh, oh, I wish that my child will be white as the snow and red as the blood. And that evening, she gave birth. And later that evening, she died. And her husband buried her beneath the juniper tree. And every day, he would go out and water the tree with his tears. And for months, and months he would water the tree. And after some time though, he would water the tree less and less until eventually he didn't water the tree at all. He married another woman and they were happy. And she gave birth to a beautiful little girl by the name of Marlenkin. And Marlenkin loved her brother. The two of them grew up together and they were almost inseparable. Almost two souls in one and one soul in two. One day, the young man, the young boy came home and he said to mother, mother, may I have an apple? And when his stepmother looked at him, the evil one came into her soul and she said, yes, you may have an apple. Just go over, go over to the apple bin and get one for yourself. And so he went over and he said, mother, the lid is too heavy. Oh, well, then I'll lift it for you. Do you see any apples? Yes, there's one down right down there at the bottom. And as he put his head into the bin, to see it. He slammed the head. She slammed the lid down upon his neck and his head fell in amongst the apples. She realized now what she had done and she thought. And very quickly she cleaned up the blood, took the body of the boy and, and placed him on a chair and took the head and placed it back upon his neck and took a white scarf and wrapped it around the neck so that one could not see that they had ever been severed. And she placed an apple, a beautiful red apple, in his dead hand. And he sat there with the apple in his hand. And when Marlinkin came, she said, Mother, may I have an apple? She said, Well, your brother has an apple. Have him give that to you. And so she went over to her brother and she said, brother, may, may I have the apple? And the brother said, nothing. May I, mother said, you should give me the apple. He said, nothing. She said, mother, he isn't talking to me and he looks so pale. She said, well, box his ears. And she did. And his head fell at her feet and she shrieked. And her mother came and stood by her side and she said, Marlenkin, what have you done? Well, we must fix this. And so they took, she took the body of the boy and put it in her biggest pot and boiled it and boiled it and boiled it until the bones separated from the meat. And the father came home and he said, first thing, where is my son? 
She said, oh, he's off visiting his aunt in the next village. Oh, very well then. What is for dinner? I have made a savory stew. Well, let's try it, he said. And so she poured him a bowl and he said, this is the most amazing stew I have ever tasted. There is something special about this stew. As a matter of fact, I think this stew is meant just for me. None for either of you. This is for me. And he ate the entire contents of the pot and threw the bones under his chair. And he and his wife went to bed. But Marlenkin sat in the kitchen, staring at the bones. And so she took those bones out to the backyard, out to the juniper tree, and she buried the bones beneath the lowest boughs of the juniper tree. And she went back in to the house, said her prayers and went to sleep. Meanwhile, the branches of the juniper tree waved in the wind as if hands coming together and clapping. And then they opened, and from out of the center of the juniper tree came a beautiful golden bird, and it flew away. It flew until it came to the edge of the village, and it stopped at a shoemaker's stop, a shoemaker's shop, and it perched on the shoemaker's sign. And it sang, My mother, she killed me. My father, he ate me. My sister, my Lincoln, placed my bones under the juniper tree. Oh, what a beautiful bird am I. And the shoemaker, the shoemaker heard that as he was working late at night and he came out and he looked and he saw that bird and he said, Oh, bird, bird, sing again. Please sing again. I will not sing. I will not sing unless I am given a gift. And the shoemaker ran quickly back into his shop and he picked up what he had been working on, a beautiful beautiful pair of red velvet slippers, exactly the size of a girl like Marlenkin, all red velvet and stitched with gold. And he threw the slippers up and the bird caught him in one claw. And he sang, my mother, she killed me. My father, he ate me. My sister, my Lincoln, placed my bones under the juniper tree. Oh, what a beautiful bird am I. And the bird flew away, leaving the cobbler with tears in his eyes at the beauty that he had heard. And the bird flew and flew to another shop, this time a goldsmith. And the goldsmith heard the bird on his sign singing, and he stopped hammering and listened. My mother, she killed me. My father, he ate me. My sister, my Lincoln, placed my bones under the juniper tree. Oh, what a beautiful bird am I. And the goldsmith came out and he said, Oh, bird, oh, bird, sing again, sing again. Again, and the bird said, I will not sing unless I am given a gift. Well, the goldsmith had just finished working on an amazing golden chain fit for a man of high degree. And he came out with that chain and he threw it up to the bird and the bird caught it in his other claw. 
My mother, she killed me. My father, he ate me. My sister, Marlene, placed my bones under the juniper tree. Oh, what a beautiful bird am I. And then the bird flew away, and it flew to the edge of town, to the side of the river, and there was the mill. And the millers were working, grinding the wheat and making it into flour. But under and over the sound of the millstones, they heard the most beautiful voice they'd ever heard. My mother, she killed me. My father, she ate me. My sister, my Lincoln, placed my bones under the juniper tree. Oh, what a beautiful bird am I. And the millers to a man said, Oh, bird, bird, sing again, sing again. And the bird said, I will not sing unless you give me a gift. And the millers were dumbfounded. What could we give this bird as a gift? And one said, the millstone. And so they all together lifted the millstone up. And the bird, with no trouble at all, took the millstone around its neck and sang, my mother, she killed me. My father, he ate me. My sister, my Lincoln, placed my bones under the juniper tree. Oh, what a beautiful bird am I. And the bird flew back flew back across the town, past the goldsmiths, past the cobbler, and back to the house in which the little boy had died. And it perched in the tree. And as the father and his wife and Marlenkin sat in the cottage, they heard a voice. My mother, she killed me. The mother said, did you hear something? Yes, I did, said Merlincoln. It's beautiful. My father, he ate me. Where's it coming from, said the father. I don't know, said the mother. My sister, my Lincoln, placed my bones. It's nothing, said the mother. It's nothing. Uh, there is nothing there. It is only the wind. Under the juniper tree. And Marlenkin and her father said, No, it's in the back. It's in the juniper tree. Oh, what a beautiful bird am I. And when Marlenkin and her father ran out the back door of the house, the woman hid beneath her bed. And they stood, Marlenkin and her father, stood beneath the juniper tree. And she said, Marlenkin said, Oh bird, you are beautiful. Your song is beautiful. And the bird looked down at her and with one claw, he dropped the velvet slippers before her. And she put them on and they fit. And she said, bird, bird, oh, thank you, thank you. And then he looked at his father. And with the other claw, he threw the golden chain down and it fell right upon the father's neck. And the father said, thank you, bird, from the bottom of my heart. And the two of them went back into the house. And when the woman came out from under the bed and she saw those beautiful gifts, she said, there must be something for me. And she ran back out into the yard. She looked up into the tree and saw the bird and she said, bird, bird, do you have a gift for me? And the bird looked down and he nodded. And the millstone slid from off his neck 
and on to her and pushed her down into the ground and some say all the way through to perdition and with great flames the hole in the ground closed but with all of that commotion Merlenkin and her father came back out into the yard and saw nothing until the bottom branches of the tree opened and the little boy ran out from the branches and into the arms of his father and his loving sister. And the three of them went back into the house and they were very happy. Make of that what you will. Maurice Sendak did a beautiful illustrated version of that. And I just discovered the other day that there was a film made in Iceland uh, about, two th about 1990 that was actually Bjork's first film that is based on that story. And I found that it's available on uh, Amazon Prime. And I, that's one of the things I want to see within the next couple of days. On a lighter note, there was once a man who lived in the west of Iceland. His name was Eden, and Eden was poor, but was a hard worker. And he took a job on the other side of the island and worked and worked and worked and made enough money that he would be able to take care of his mother for three years but made enough money that he was also able to take a trip to Greenland. And there, from a hunter, he bought a magnificent polar bear. He took that polar bear on ship, made sure that his mother had enough money that for three years so that he might leave her. And he sailed across the Northern Oceans on his way to Denmark, but the ship put into Norway. And at that time, the king of Norway was the great Harald Hadrada. When it got about that there was a man in port with a polar bear, Harald Hadrada found out about the polar bear and demanded that Othen come to his court. And Ethan stood before Held Hadrada. And Harold said, um, Where'd you get the polar bear? So I bought it in Greenland. And how much did you pay for it? And he told him the price. If I were to give you that price, would you give it to me? No. If I were to give you twice the price, would you give it to me? No, I would not. Would you give it to me as a gift? No, Your Majesty, no, I wouldn't. Well, what are you going to do with it? Well, I am taking it to Denmark, and I'm going to give it as a gift to King Svein of Denmark. Now, Harald Hadrada looked at him, and he said, Are you crazy? Don't you realize that I am at war? was Swain, what's to stop me from taking that bear from you? Well, I would say your honor as a king. And Harold Hadrada stopped and he said, mm, good answer. Very well then, I'm going to give you dinner for the night and I'm going to let you have free passage to go to Denmark, but once you have finished your visit. I want you to come back here and visit me and tell me what happens. And so he did. And Uthen set sail and made it to Denmark. And this is where Aki comes in. Aki discovered that Uthen was there with his polar bear. And Aki said, well, I'm looking at you, you've got the bear, but you have nothing else. How are you going to survive here until you get an audience with the king? I don't know, but I'm going to have to trust in it, said Uthen. 
Well, very well then, I can make a deal with you. You give me half the value of that bear, and I will make sure that you are well fed and that the king sees you immediately. And so it wasn't much longer that Uthen and his bear were brought before King Svein. And Uthen said, thank you very much for, uh, for your hospitality, your majesty. I have come all the way from Greenland to give you this bear. And Svein was dumbfounded. And he said, I am absolutely amazed. What an amazing, what a wonderful piece of generosity. And you did this with your own money. Well, I will say that your counselor here, your, your steward, Aki, helped me for half the price of the bear. For half the price of the bear. Aki, is this true? Um, yes, it is. Aki, you have shamed me and my court with the generosity that this man has shown. This is no nobleman. This is a man who's gone out of his way to give me this gift, and you would take half of that gift? You are banished from my court. You are banished from my country. If I ever see you again, your head will be on a pike. Now, Swain welcomed Ethan into his court. He treated him as a son, and Ethan stayed with him and was treated royally, and the king and Ethan became dear, dear friends. After he was there for some time, Ethan said, My lord, I would like to leave, and Svein said, well, why on earth would you want to leave? And Ethan said, well, I would like to make a pilgrimage to Rome while I am here upon the continent. Well, of course you shall, he said, and he gave him enough silver to get to Rome and back. And Ethan did go to Rome as a pilgrim, and there he visited the cathedrals, there he prayed, there he even saw the Pope. But on his return journey, he was stricken with a plague. And midway, he fell ill, and all of his money went to pay for his medicine. He all but crawled back to Denmark. His hair had fallen out. He was emaciated. He was in beggar's rags when he came back to the court of Denmark. And much as he wanted to show himself and see his friend, the king, again, he could not for embarrassment. But out of the corner of his eye, King Svein saw someone he thought he knew. And he said, Is there anyone in this court who might wish to address me? All turned and looked upon Ethan in his beggar's rags. And he came forth and identified himself and told the king what had happened to him. And the king, the king had him cleansed, the king had his physicians tend to him and clothed him and was about to make him his cupbearer. When Uthen, who now was healthy again, said, My liege, I must now leave you. I have been gone far too long from Iceland. My mother had money only for three years, and those three years are up, and she will starve if I do not return. And King Svein said, It is noble that you should do that for your mother. And you cannot leave empty-handed. You cannot show up. First of all, you need a ship, a ship of your own. For how could you return to your home and people look and say, well, he had to hire a ship, even though he had visited King Svein and given him a princely gift. And so he gave him a ship. And that ship 
was filled with merchant goods that he could sell in Iceland and on the way there. And he said, though, that is still not enough because ships do wreck. And if this ship were to wreck, you would be left with nothing that would show that you had been to Denmark and given King Svein a princely gift. And so here, and he gave him a bag of silver worth as much as the ship. And he said, still, that is not enough. For you might lose the silver, you might lose the ship, but you not, might need the aid of someone. And so here, and he reached, and he took a golden arm ring, delicately wrought with images of dragons and heroes. He said, here, take this. I want you to keep that and give it to no one unless it is a person of great esteem to whom you owe a great deal. They embraced, and Ethan took ship, and the first place he landed was in Norway. And he went to the court of Harald Hadrada, and Harald gave him a tankard of mead and said, Ethan, tell me of your adventures. How were you treated by Svein of Denmark? And Ethan told him all about being taken into the court, about the trip to Rome, and about the gifts that he was given. He gave me a ship. He gave me merchant goods. He gave me silver. Well, said, said Harold Hadrada, I would have given you a ship. And the silver, I would have given you that too. And the trip to Rome, well, Swain does that for everyone. But come to think of it, I probably wouldn't have given you the silver. I think that it, the deal would have considered, been considered equal with the ship. And Ethan said, there was one more thing he gave me. this arm ring and he told me to give it to no one except to someone of great esteem and wisdom and to whom I am greatly indebted and I give it to you. And Harold Hadrada took him into his court, gave him the finest sword that his smith could make gave him a fine cloak and a ship to go with them. And with his two ships, Ethan returned home to the arms of his mother. And all said that he was a man of great luck. But I think Vikings were pragmatic enough to know that in this world, you make your own luck. That shows up in a lot of different uh, Viking sagas. And I'm sorry I blew it in the middle. I haven't told it in a while. I'm going to finish with one of my favorite stories. And this also is from the Brothers Grimm. It's called The Bearskin. The soldier had been in the army since boyhood. The only trade he knew was how to be a soldier. And now the wars were over. There was nothing, nothing for him. He had no skills other than killing. And he had had his fill, but he had nothing. He could barely remember where his father's farm was, and he knew by this time that his father was dead. And he knew that his brothers would have divided it up between the three of them, and that he would have gotten nothing. And every town he came to, when people saw his uniform, even though they might have been grateful before, they had nothing to say to him 
but perhaps a few things to throw. And so he stood at a crossroads and he looked at the limb of a tree that come, came out where the two roads crossed. He said, yes, it will do. And he thought of the rope that was in his knapsack. Now, when we stand at a crossroads and when we have thoughts like that, there is one being in all the world that is very, very interested in those thoughts. And that being was not far away. And in those times and in those parts, he was recognized by a high beaver hat and a long green cloak and a fine patent leather shoe and a cloven hoof. And in a shorter time than it takes to tell it, he stood before the soldier. Oh, would you do that? Would you indeed do that? After having survived how many battles? After having fought for your life for so many times? You would throw your life away like that? I doubt it. Let us see. And with a wave of his hand, there appeared before the soldier a huge black bear star staring at him and now running toward him with his mouth wide open and huge fangs ready for him. And the soldier did not even think. He took the dagger from his belt and threw it, and it went straight between the bear's eyes, and the bear fell down dead. The stranger hobbled over to the bear and pulled the knife from the bear's skull. You're a soldier, and you take bets. I will make a wager with you. Come with me. Before they moved, the devil, for so he was, skinned the bear and took the raw and bloody hide from the bear. He turned to the soldier and he said, take off your clothes. The soldier, who was used to taking orders, did so, though he could not have later told you why. And the devil placed one arm of the bear skin over one shoulder and the other arm of the bear skin over the other shoulder so that the bear skin encased him. And the devil said, you shall wear that bear skin night and day. You shall never take it off for seven years. You shall not shave. You shall not bathe. You shall not pare the nails of your hands nor your feet. And you shall not say the Pater Noster for seven years. If at the end of seven years you are still alive, your life and your soul and riches are all yours. But if you die at any time, your soul is mine. The soldier said, very well. And so it began. But he thought before he left the devil and he said, wait, 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 how am I to survive? I can't hunt like this. I have no weapons. I cannot perform a trade. How shall I survive? And the devil smiled and he took the cloak from off his shoulders and placed it over the bearskin. And he said, reach into the right hand pocket inside. And he did, the soldier did and he pulled out a handful of coins. 
No matter how many times you reach into that pocket, there will always be coins. And so, into the world he went. And the first two years were not that bad, truly. Uncomfortable, but not bad. And outlandish, though he was beginning to look with his untrimmed beards and his nails starting to grow long and the smelly bear skin, he could, if he walked into a public house, get service if he put enough money on the counter. And so it went because there is an amazing amount of things that money can buy. The next two years, well, the next two years, insects had come and they had laid their eggs in the bare skin and their larvae were constantly moving between the bear's skin and the soldiers. And he could feel them and occasionally he could feel them chewing the nails on his hands were turning brown and they were getting hard and it was very hard to tell where the bear's skin, where, and we'll call him bear skin by the way, where bear skin's beard intermingled with the skin itself. But still, some coins thrown at a distance could buy some food thrown at a distance and perhaps a place in the stable, but mind you, you keep up, you keep downwind of the horses and I don't want to see you again. And so those two years passed. The next two years, the next two years, he could feel the larvae, he could feel the worms chewing into his skin, eating him alive. Every second was fire. Every second was stench. He was disgusted with his own filth. And the claws on his hands were now claws. They were hard as iron and long as the claws of the bear itself. The nails on his feet were so long he could barely walk like a human. And his voice almost gone because there had been no one to talk to at all. And he did learn to hunt and there were things that he ate which no human should eat. But still he lurked on the outskirts of human habitation. And there was one thing that kept him going and that was hope. But one night, as he came as near as he dared to an inn to see what he could find among the refuse, he saw something that broke his heart. The innkeeper threw an old man out the door and kicked him in the small of his back and said, you, you don't come into my, my public house again and beg. You stay away. And the old man sat weeping and bearskin, his voice creaking and groaning from years of not being used with another human, said, how, how dare you treat another in such a way. And the innkeeper shrieked and he pulled himself back into his inn, shut the door and barred it. And the old man cowered there on the steps of the inn. But Bearskin said, no, no, no. He saw that the old man wore the remnants of a white silk shirt and velvet breeches. Bearskin said, How did you come to this pass? And the old man told him how once he had been a wealthy merchant with three fair daughters and a beautiful house, and how one 
by one by one each of his ships had sunk, leaving him and his daughters with nothing. Bearskin looked at him, and he reached into the pocket of the cloak, and handful after handful after handful of coins he dropped into the old man's lap. And Bearskin said, Take me to where you live. The old man said, I will. How can I repay you? I would have the hand of one of your daughters in marriage. The old man looked at him and he could not bear to gainsay such a request. And so the two of them walked to the old man's hovel, hardly a hut, and his three daughters met him at the door. And he said, daughters, look, and he showed them the coins. And the three daughters said, oh, father, father will be rich again. We will be rich. And one said, I'll have dresses. Oh, I want a parrot. We'll have the finest house in the town. And the youngest daughter, and we'll call her Rose, said, father, where did this money come from? And her father told her about Bearskin and about Bearskin's request. And the two elder daughters turned up their noses and said, Oh, that is disgusting. How could anyone even consider it? But Rose wept and she said, Bring him to me, for that suffering that he must be going through, and to give you the money. His heart must be of gold. I will marry him gladly. And at that, bearskin stepped into the cottage. The two elder daughters shrieked and ran to the far end of the cottage. But when Rose saw him, she fell to her knees, and his t her tears washed his feet. He looked down at her and pulled her back up by her elbows, stood her in front of him. And he reached into the pocket of the cloak, and he pulled out a golden ring, and he broke it in two. And with his claw, he inscribed one half of it, bare skin. And he pulled out a golden chain and affixed it and put it around her neck. And then he took the other half and inscribed it, rose fixed the chain to that and put it around his neck where it disappeared in amongst the fur and the beard. He said, I will return in a year and a day and I shall take you as my bride. If I do not come, then marry who you will, for I shall be dead. Pray for me. And he left. And the days went by so slowly for Rose. They had a new house. Her father had riches. He bought new ships. Success had come back to the family. And many suitors came to their door, but all the suitors came for Rose. None came for the two elder sisters. And they sat and they glowered and they whined and they sneered. But Rose waited 
and waited and waited. And the year passed, and it came toward the end of the day. And she said, he isn't coming. And she heard the sound of a coach and four pulling up outside her door. And she saw it was a beautiful white coach pulled by four of the be most beautiful white horses and a handsome young man at the reins with a beautiful glowing white linen suit and a wonderful watch and chain. And she knew what she would say to him. She would say, I cannot marry you. Upon the next morning, I am going into the convent, and there I shall live my days. This was the last year for bearskin. And the pain and the torture were ten times that of all the other years combined. He could feel the vermin eating to his bones. His own stench made it almost impossible for him to eat. His disgust with himself was knew no bounds. But there was one thing, one thing that kept him alive. The thought of Rose and the hope that came with that. And so it was on the last day of the bargain, he stood at the crossroads. And as he looked up at the branch that he had once contemplated, he heard a voice at his side. Oh, you would not be thinking of that again, would you? I don't think, I think not, because you seem to have won the wager. Look at you. Oh my God. Oh Lord. Look. How can I even say those words? See how far you've pushed me? Oh my, you are terrible. We have to, oh, be silent, said Bearskin. Take this Bearskin from my back, and the devil said gladly. And with his claws under one arm of the bearskin and under the other, he pulled it up first gently and then ripped it from bearskin's shoulders. And bearskin gave a scream of pain and joy. And he looked down at his body and he saw where the maggots had eaten him and he turned and he said wash this filth from off me and the devil led him down to a stream and with a sponge he cleansed every part of bearskin's body and it was clear and clean as that of a newborn child and then he turned and he said Pair my nails. And the devil had a pair of shears. And, ting, 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 ting. and his hands and his feet were human once more. And then he said, Shave me. The devil sat him down on a stump. And he pulled out a razor as sharp as anything in hell. And he shaved Bearskin, and Bearskin could feel what that razor wanted to do, and could not. And soon enough, Bearskin stood. He was younger than he was before the bargain. He looked at his reflection in the river and he was pleased and he said clothe me and he wore 
a beautiful white linen suit and a marvelous gold watch and chain. Give me the riches, he said. And there was a coach and four beside the path. And he said to the devil, Say the pater noster! And the devil said, You ask too much of me! And he disappeared in a puff of dirty smoke. And so it was within the hour that he pulled up in his beautiful coach and four and knocked at Rose's door. And Rose looked at him and she said, I cannot. He reached inside his shirt and he pulled out a golden ring inscribed with the name Rose. And without a word, she reached into her blouse and pulled out the other half of the ring inscribed with the name Bearskin. And they put the two together and there was a flash as bright as the sun. And it was with that ring that they were wed that very day. There were two guests that did not appear at the wedding. For when the eldest, the elder of her two sisters, saw what had transpired between Bearskin and her youngest sister, she was filled with wrath, she was filled with jealousy, and she went and threw herself into the river where Bearskin had been bathed. And the second of her two sisters was filled with that same anger, bitterness, and jealousy. And she ran into the road and she found an old rope at a crossroads and she threw it up over the bough of a tree. And she did what Bearskin had intended seven years ago. And so it was that after the wedding, when Bearskin and Rose sat in that beautiful coach, driving from the church into life, the horses stopped. There was a figure in the road, and they knew their master, a figure with a high beaver hat, a long green cloak, one patent leather shoe, and one cloven hoof. And he hobbled up to the coach and he said, congratulations, your lives shall be long, happy, and prosperous. You shall go to a fine reward. You have my word upon that. Your souls are your own. But where you have gained your soul, I have gained two. And I am the winner in the wager. And that is the end of Bearskin. And I want to thank everyone for coming and listening. I intend to be here again. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and have a wonderful week, and stay healthy.